what a great day it has been for me to be able to witness practitioners learning from practitioners. Um, there were some exciting things um, happening in the, in the classrooms where teachers were really learning how to explore in the way that our children explore. And, and so this quote was part of an email that went around the administrative team. And I just thought it was interesting um, and I want to share it with you. In 2015, Uber, the world's largest taxi cab company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's largest and most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. And Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. And what was so inspirational for me about that is as I watched the imagination, the creativity, and yes, the skill um, that people were applying um, in those workshops, it made me think about the great potential that, that the arts unleash. And with that said, I am going to be quiet because I think we have some wonderful learning that we can do together in this forum. Um, we have an awesome panel and a wonderful moderator who will introduce themselves. Um, but I just want you to remember that this is really about a dialogue. The whole day has been about an exchange, and we need to continue that as part of this forum. So thank you all for being here. I'm excited about the conversation that we're about to have. And I'm now going to turn, turn it over to John Little. John? John is our department chair um, uh, performing arts. We did steal him from a wonderful city school. <laughs> and he's done an enormous job in terms of expanding our orchestra program, theater program, and also um, he's taken on an added goal this year of working with our fine arts um, teachers. So thank you, John, for being here and for we'll us again. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's, that's grand. Uh, I think you've actually said about as much about me as I need to have said about this. <laughs> I don't need to, to bore you with more details here, but I think it would be valuable for each of the panelists to be able to describe a little bit about themselves, what they do, and what they're bringing to the, to the program today. So, Lydia? Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Lydia Scrivenich. This is my 10th year as a teacher at Dwight Englewood. Um, I taught four years of public school before that. I teach grades 6 through ninth grade. Um, designated as a middle school visual arts teacher, which means I teach all of the sixth graders, seventh graders, and the eighth grade class, which is an elective class in our middle school. Um, and Kit? Yeah. Hi, uh, Kit Saylor. I am a teaching artist, which is different than an art teacher. <laughs> um, I have experience teaching every age from pre-K up to people in their 80s. Uh, I teach um, I teach adults in Summit at the Visual Arts Center of New Jersey. Uh, I do uh, artists and education grants, residencies through the State Council of the Arts. Uh, Arts Horizons has given me some really wonderful opportunities. Oh, and I teach ATI oil painting, which is the highlight of my year. <laughs> Every year teaching the teachers because they're fabulous. They're really wonderful to work with. And I'm a painter, by the way. Uh, my name is Michael Shannon, and uh, most of my uh, time is spent uh, running a uh, small foundation, the Northern New Jersey Community Foundation, and in that regard, on the channel there, there are, there's a, some single sheets of paper, if you're interested about an initiative that we're uh, getting underway with and enjoying the association and support of the County Department of Historic and Cultural Affairs, whose director is Cynthia Forster, who is with us today. Uh, but this is Arts Bergen, which is a new arts council for Bergen County. Uh, and so it, it, all of the questions we'll be discussing are very much questions that we hope to help answer, whatever. So. Um, I mean, and my art background, is I, I, I am an artist, I'm not really a professional working artist, but I, I do it. 
Uh, and professionally, in my career for 35 years, I was an industrial designer in the furniture business. So I'm a, I'm a furniture designer uh, by training. And uh, design is my kind of what I think about all the time. So we're in this environment where we have artists who are able to teach artists. We have an opportunity for dialogue between people who are all involved in this field. And there's a set, set of questions that we wanted to address. There's probably enough uh, material in any one of these questions for us to spend a week sequestered in this room talking about each of the one individually. However, these are going to be the seeds of the beginning of what hopefully will become a much, much larger discussion and continuing effort over, over days, months, weeks, years as we address where we are going with the arts and how they fit. The one thing that is amazing to me constantly because I grew up in the 1950s and the 1960s and have seen so much change in my own lifetime is that with all of that cha change that has gone on, at least in the field of art that I'm involved with, which is classical music, it has always transcended the change. There have been changes have affected it, but it has never diminished it in any significant way. Um, that can't be worked around to make it even better perhaps than it was before once we learn the vehicles. So, there are six questions and I think what we'll do is <coughs> we will work through the questions with, uh, with our panel briefly and then what I'd like to do is to come back to each question and or just open forum for people to be able to ask questions of us or of each other. Um, then, um, we can just see where it goes, okay? So the first question I would, would does everybody have a printed version of the question? Mm -hmm. No, let me read them down so that you have some idea of what's happening here. The first question would be ideally, what should be children, uh, what should children be learning in the arts K through 12? The second question is, if you could build a roadmap, how would you construct a model arts education? The third question is, what does arts education look like currently in our K through 12 schools? The fourth question is, what is the value of arts education in school? That's a big one. How do we, the fifth question is, how do we leverage the arts to build other important skills, including design thinking and problem solving? And the final question, how do we integrate the arts into core discipline? So let's start off with that first one. Ideally, what should children be learning in the arts K through 12? So do we have a volunteer on the panel here to, to take that one up? Yeah, sure. Um, so this question, I think when children arrive to our classes in the middle school, we stress to them the importance of community. Um, we strive to create a community in our school and very important to that is who you are, of course, what you bring to the table, what you can teach others, and what they can learn from you. Um, I think that's one of the most important things that, that children should experience across all grades. How do I relate to others? How do they relate to me? What value do I have as a student, as an artist? What can I share with others? And how can they learn from me? And how can we all grow together? Um, but I think that we really emphasize that, and it helps us create a climate in our classroom that is open and free for expression and it's not intimidating, it's somewhere the kids look forward to being and sharing um, and being themselves. So I think creating community, teaching kids how to be part of a community of artists, not just the school community, but people who make and share and talk to one another, I think that's very important. Um, I think that the sort of the um, broader exposure to the arts is extremely important. That every child has some knowledge of music, some knowledge of visual arts, some knowledge of dance, some knowledge of creative writing, because those things sort of stay with us our whole lives. You know, who doesn't listen to music? Why shouldn't somebody know at least something about music? We look, you're in the, in the you did industrial design, you know, we touch things. Why should they not have some idea about how that affects us? They don't have to go into it as a profession, but everybody should know something about those things. 
You're right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> And I'm just going to add in, even though I'm not a panelist, that I've always felt that it was critical. If people are going to know the difference between Shakespeare and Joyce, they should know the difference between Stravinsky and Beethoven. Uh, and I think that goes all the way to Van Gogh and Renoir, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll say between a chair and a sofa. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, well, what should children be learning? I, I'm going to take kind of a, a more political and global view. Uh, and answer it again, as John said, in this other week. Uh, but uh, I believe, progressive as I am, that, that in this country, uh, because uh, education reflects the value of cultures and because our culture is oriented toward money and economics and not really toward the business of being uh, human, uh, that our education process is turned around. I think the art should be at the beginning and how to get a job and be an obedient citizen secondary. Uh, so the way it's set up is we have what, which we do pretty well with the curriculum. We have how, which is what pedagogy is all about. The art's about why. Uh, why are we? Why do we exist? Who are we? Uh, getting back to Socrates saying, know thyself. Art is the way you come out and you emerge in the world, you present yourself. It's not because you do math well or can write an essay, but I think people have to begin their lives with being encouraged to know themselves uh, and then later the skills and the knowledge, I think, come will will come to people. Uh, so you, it's, we, in our in our thing we do we focus on the what and the how and the why is sort of a secondary forgotten consideration. I think it should just be reversed. And does it not make sense that as long as we have the New York Times having an arts and leisure department section that that means it is part of our culture. If it's going to be part of our culture, we should be aware of it in the same way that we're aware of what's going on scientifically and politically and in every other way. It's part of the full human experience. Okay, let's go on to question number two. If you could build a roadmap, how would you construct a model arts education? Which will work right down the line. Okay. <laughs> this will work. Sure. Um, well, I don't know if mine would be necessarily a roadmap, but I guess if you're starting from K and going through 12, I think, like I mentioned before, learning how to be with other artists is very important, and learning how to communicate about your art and communicate about other people's art is very important. Like you mentioned before, learning what different things are out there and how to effectively critique and talk about um, when you go into a museum, I think that's important, and be able to speak about things that you've seen and experienced. So that might be like one starting point, but I think my other starting points go with that. Um, obviously there are skills in painting and drawing and the elements and principles of design that kids should really know. Um, there's a phrase, you have to learn something before you can unlearn it. So I think in a model arts education uh, system there would be a place where you can learn all of that, but then you have free opportunities too, where you can unlearn and just explore and, and try different things. Um, and I think that's one of the things I love about where I teach, there's the elective courses that children can sign up for and be, you know, they're themselves. They know how to do certain things, they know how to work with a variety of media, they learn how to explore different media in that setting, so I think that's great. And that's one way, I think, to kind of mesh everything together. So learning and unlearning somehow in one experience would be great. Uh, I take a look slightly more. I think those are all great points. I, you know, when I thought, looked at this question, I sort of took this sort of structural approach. The first part of it being exposure, that every child should know what's out there. Um, they should know all levels of, uh, of and like I said before, all of the arts. I think that's, that's very important. And they should know what the highest level is. Because you know what kids do, they take something, they copy it, they put their own spin on it, so let's show them the best thing that's out there. So there's the exposure, 
then I think that everybody needs a little hands-on, a little practical, and then you need an advanced for the kid, for the children that really uh, excel or have great interest. Sometimes they have one, the other, sometimes both. Uh, and you and then you need an advanced curriculum for those kids. Well, of course, I agree with everything that's being said. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> my uh, again, just trying to jump on a single idea. Um, the best art school that I know about is called Reggio Emilia. It's a pre-K school uh, and started it after the Second World War in Italy. Uh, it's, oh, I, I hesitate to say this, it's a little like Montessori, but I think it's more sophisticated in, in some degrees uh, and harder, much harder to teach, which is why uh, it's not all over the place because it's, it's in 69 countries now. Uh, and I'm very interested uh, as part of the work I'm trying to do to, to uh, bring the Reggio Emilia Center to northern New Jersey. Uh, but anyway, the, the school is based on the radical idea that young, tiny, uh, they, they go infant, toddler, and, and now they're developing uh, education to move up into the curriculum. But it's basically that these ignorant uh, little human beings are people, uh, which is a you know, idea. And that the relationship of the teachers to them is a peer relationship, is that there's uh, mutual learning to be done. It's not all from the teacher down to the kid, but there is a, a, a dialogue and by the way, the parents are, it really is a triangular, um, intense conversation uh, between three parties with mutual learning. The teachers absolutely believe they've got as much to learn as the children. And it's, it's, it's arts-based, and that it, it's project-based in a sense. Uh, it, it's emergent in the idea that the children can come up with the ideas, they'll see a bird out the window, a squirrel, and, shadows on the wall and they'll come up with ideas that the teachers say, oh, well, that's a good idea. What are you going to do about it? And so the kids build themselves their own learning. And it goes on. Yeah, I, I probably said it out, but to me, this is the model. And maybe a little bit, like I said first, getting the, the beginning right goes a long way to getting the last three quarters right in education. Got to get, you've got to get the kids oriented, in love with themselves and the world, and knowledge, and curious, and unafraid, secure, confident, and energetic, creative, all that stuff. Uh, you have to, it's there. You have not to stifle it, but build it. Okay. <laughs> I go on about it. Now, would it be safe to say, would I be on safe ground to say that? that in order to be able to foster these skills, uh, these appreciations, that it should be done on a daily basis. It should become a regular part of curriculum as opposed to in so many institutions where you have art once a week or... Well, there's whatever. a question that, that and I, yes, yeah, 100%, 24 hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a question that relates to that. I thought that was a wonderful description. Unfortunately, no one had mentioned evaluation, which is a big part of your job as a teacher. You have to assign a grade. I wonder how people feel about the aspect of evaluating a student's performance. Because I find that the most difficult if you are a teacher. I would love to give everybody A's, but I can't. And I think we, we should definitely come back to that. Okay. I will, so save the okay. question and please don't forget. Okay. Okay, well, start out there after we get through all of these because there are so many dimensions here. Okay, so the third question is, what does arts education look like currently in our K through 12 schools? Uh, well, <laughs> I started out in public school. Like I mentioned before, I, I've been here quite a while. so. Um, in both experiences, there's very different experiences, and I think the value that an independent school has, this is where I'm speaking, you know, this is where I am, this is what I can speak to. Um, classes are smaller, we're able to touch base with kids more frequently, 
we have things that are available or in place in our schedule where kids can come to us outside of regular class time, which is great. Um, I think that we have a very supportive administration that allows us to do and try out new things that maybe aren't possible in public school settings. Um, I've never heard no from my principal, so I'm very blessed and very happy. She might say, I'll get back to you on that, I'll look that up and I'll see if it's possible, but I've never heard a flat out no, we can't do that. Anything that supports the whole child in her book and in the eyes of the administrators is fantastic. How can we get there? Maybe we start out small, maybe we try something, maybe it fails and that's okay. Um, we'll make it better for next time. So I think I'm very blessed to be in a situation where I can explore with my colleague um, different ways of teaching, um, different courses, different ideas, introducing different materials and having club settings where kids can come and go. And It's always something that's important to everyone in the school. It's not just something that's an aside. And we're actually working on making it even better. Um, so it's not finished. Our work is not done. It's never like, you know, this is it. We've arrived. So we're constantly coming up with new ways and new things and new media, new techniques, new people that can come in and visit and speak with kids. So I, I'm very fortunate. Uh, I can contrast a couple of <laughs> 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 Uh, I just finished up a six-week residency at a pre-K to second grade school in Weehawken where, the, where the, the, the school board funds an artist to come in for six weeks and do a project with every child in the school. And there's a fabulous budget involved. I get paid a professional wage. I love doing it. The kids are great. We get to sort of imagine you know, oh, let's do this, let's do that, and it's, it's very stimulating to design that program, especially for somebody like who's four. Uh, and that's great, and the project is wonderful, and you know, they're kids, some of them are, participate more than others. Then I'm doing a, a residency at an elementary school in Newark. I'm working with sixth and eighth graders to do a 700 square foot mural. Uh, they don't offer art to fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders at that school. It's only in the younger grades. And I feel really terrible as teachers, like, oh, we're so happy you're here because the kids really want to do this and this gives them an opportunity. This is a school that has made an, an effort to get a grant from the state to bring somebody in to do something special. So this is one of the good schools and they only offer it up to the fourth grade. I've been in schools where a child comes into the artwork, and I'm sure you all know that. Like, oh, my teacher wants some paper to do something. This girl was asking for some green paper, and the art teacher had to turn to her and say, sweetie, we haven't had green paper in three years. So it's, there's just, the, 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 there's so many different levels of um, opportunity that's out there, you know, within 10 miles of each other. It's strange. Mm -hmm. Um, that speaks to the value issue uh, in the society. <clears throat> uh, so what, what I would say again, um, <laughs> sounds like it's kind of polemic that I'm using this as kind of an excuse. Uh, K-12 art as taught in our school system is separate. It's a separate class. Almost by definition, you've eliminated what I think is one of its most fundamental values, which, and, and there will be a question about how do we infuse arts throughout the curriculum. But I think absolutely it should be infused throughout the curriculum. Throughout the curriculum. And having an art school says right there that this is something separate, uh, you have a life, and then you use art. Uh, that's, to me, that's anathema. That's not the way it should be. So, uh, and, and it occurs uh, just as Ken was saying, uh, in a, uh, the kids sense the challenge uh, for the teachers. They, they sense there's something mysteriously uh, wrong with the arts because of the way, I mean, they have eyes and ears and they can feel these things as though art is in some way subversive or out there uh, sort of weird or something. Uh, so, I, I'm, I'm exaggerating on this. But there is that, there is that tension. 
uh, between you. Got to get the curriculum, you know, the test. I mean, I'm being judged as a teacher, so I just don't have time for that. I'm sorry. Uh, there it is. So, uh, some great schools, but some problems. That's, that's kind of the way I'm going to keep sounding. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think the answer to the question is that, that there are inconsistencies. That we as a culture do yeah. not have a consistent commitment. Because the, the message from up there <coughs> is so mixed sure. and so confused. Well, isn't, isn't it a little ironic that we have never had a president since Kennedy who was really a proponent of the arts and actually it was his wife? Yeah. You, you know. Well, that's, that's a very good point. Right. They're lawyers. Right. Exactly. So, so the emphasis in our culture and, and in our media uh, tends not to go toward the dark that we're talking about. Not to make money. So what is the value of arts education in school? Let's start at the other end this time. Oh, I need time to warm up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were already starting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I guess yeah, the, yeah. I'll start. Oh, I'll start. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> I think that the arts are, are, are really important to kids because uh, they, it allows them to have success without knowing the right answer. I mean, really when it comes right down to it, that's probably, for me, the most important thing. I give you an idea, I make sure that my idea has enough open ends, that they can do it their way, and you know, and I try to design it so that they will do something unique. That's what I want to be surprised. That that's what success looks like to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and to have a child who can do that and can turn around and maybe look at a math problem that they don't necessarily understand, but they can maybe understand that it doesn't. They can come up with their own way around it if they have to, or they can discover that they can apply critical thinking. I mean, I really think that arts is, is, is so important to different ways of thinking and to becoming an individual and to being creative in all of your pursuits, no matter what you go into. I think it's very important. Um, I, I don't know how many of us are visual artists in the audience. Okay, I've been involved in my drawings and paintings and thinking to myself, that line just says what I wanted, wanted it to say without it saying anything, without it having spoken to anyone or having any words. Um, I think that's one of the main values of not just visual, but performing arts. That spoken word piece can say what I want it to say, but without the traditional language that I would have said it in, in another setting. So there's something about arts where you can express yourself in a way that you can't in other places. Um, I think that's something to me that I try and remember every single time I look at a child's work. Um, it might not look like what I thought it might look like, or it should look like, but it means something to that child. It's saying something about who they are and what they intended to say. So yes, it's valuable and it means something, and it should mean something to your fellow artists too. So I think that's one of the, the very important things that I always think that, that um, art education does for a student. Um, and that's something that could happen and, and like you said, help you in other places to solve things creatively, come up with your own ways of thinking, um, and maybe just using that discipline from art in other areas, too. Um, I, I would, it relates for me to the first question about the, the purpose of art for an individual, which is to uh, present that aspect of themselves, which is not a body of knowledge of, of, agreed upon or the way we do things here, but the way I am, uh, which I think is extremely important in school, in life, everywhere. Uh, again, the, the sense of separation between school and life, which is totally artificial. Uh, you know, we should be learning, uh, lifelong learning. Uh, that whole idea of lifelong learning should be inculcated in again, young children, and I think if they begin with a strong arts education like I'm talking about, they begin to see things in the world which they connect with, and lifelong learning itself is more likely to uh, follow an education that's rich in associative uh, 
project-based things where they make those connections between what I'm doing in this room and what happens in my life when I walk home and see my parents. It's all of a piece. It has to be put together. Uh, so um, know thyself. To me, that's, that's what the arts are about. So let's move right on to the, to the next one, which is, and this is a big one, how do we leverage the arts to build other important skills, including design thinking and problem solving? I think in, in studio courses, there's a constant reworking of ideas, a constant replanning and reassessing what you initially thought you would do versus what it's going to turn into or what it may become, which I think is great. It helps students think about um, designs very thoughtfully, very, um, and problems and anything they encounter, I think, very specifically. Instead of just going in and attacking something, think about your process first. Think about what you may want to do. I think that's very powerful. It's something that we do all the time when we plan our lessons and projects. We plan out our ideas first. Um, we constantly rework things and make them better or improve them or change them all together if necessary. And I think that's a very important power that the arts have that may not be so apparent in an academic class, that may not be so easy for academic course teachers to, to understand and apply. Uh, I think that the arts brings about, um, a, what do I say, it, it, um, it stimulates everybody's ability to interpret something. So no matter which art you're talking about, and no matter how you take that interpretation. I read the newspaper, I interpret it. I have an opinion, I acknowledge that opinion. A lot of kids have an opinion. They don't know how that, that, that they are allowed to acknowledge that. So they interpret, they, they take it in, they interpret it, they acknowledge it, and they have their own idea. And I think that that is really, really important for uh, everybody. Adults can learn to do that too. We <laughs> to do that. And, um, and, and this sort of <clears throat> ability to interpret and then to manipulate according to your interpretation. I mean, life skills, right? I'm, I think and I make, you know, I think I change. What you said, I change, you know, we as, as instructors, you know, we have to change what we're doing. It's like, oh, this isn't working out very well. I'm going to change something really fast now. Uh, and I think it's great for the students to see that and for the students to experience that too. Uh, well, we had a total agreement with you. Um, it's hard to get. Uh, to get um, I, I would say, uh, again, there's a differentiation. I'll, I'll use arts and crafts, for instance. Uh, I remember I, was, uh, I attended Teachers College, and I remember Maxine Green, I'm sure you all know her. Uh, but she started a class at Lincoln Center for artists, and uh, I found my way into that and teaching a design class. Uh, Maxine, uh, she's a super wonderful person, but she always made a very sharp distinction between crafts, which had this commercial kind of design uh, stigma, and, and the fine arts, which were gloriously ours gratis artists that was free and unbound to, to fill our souls with joy. Uh, my attack though, or my argument was that designing is the art of the street. Designing is, uh, uh, very quickly, just forgive me, I, I just did want to mention art of uh, John Dewey's Artist Experience. I think it's the most important arts book, period. Uh, and its main message is the, again, the separation, making art into something that's put in elite buildings that look like Greek temples, concert halls, and museums, and the absence of art, and therefore the absence of the, the emerging human being to learn to, to appreciate aesthetic, to see the aesthetic in every single action, to see grace and elegance and the beauty and things all around us. That's what, that's what, for Dewey, that's what art was about. 
not about the tastemaker's decision to put a de Kooning in the moment. So when I'm thinking about kids on the street, what's in their face? Cars, fashion, get, get them started into the ability to associate aesthetic value with all of the accoutrement of life. They need to get their hands dirty with things they can care about. So I, I refer to that as art of the street. Um, and I think that that's uh, project-based learning and, and arts, uh, uh, craft and project-based stuff is the best way, I think, uh, to, to join, uh, to make arts meaningful to the schools in terms of enabling kids to all of a sudden look out the window and say, my God, there's art out there. Yeah, right. I'm just going to add one little bit from a slightly different different tangent on that as to, to leveraging it into all of the other skills. And when I teach somebody, a beginner on the flute, the first thing I ask them is, who is your teacher? And they look at me, and if they're little enough, they say, you're my teacher. If they're big enough, they know that it's a trick question. And they, they want, wait for me to say, you are your own teacher. And I have to explain to them that your proportions are different than my proportions. Your hands are, or your arms are different things, etc. I don't know what it likes to feel, to, to feel the way you feel. And since when you play a flute especially, you can't see a thing. It's over to the side of your body. <laughs> it's all tactile, right? So there's no way that I can tell you, that I can teach you, you are going to teach yourself. I can guide you, I can be your guide. And so the process of art for me has, is also analogous to almost every other subject. Because in reality, in everything, we are our own teachers. But this is a prime opportunity to be able to see immediate results of what you have taught yourself. And so that, that works for me in the problem solving and the thinking and all of that other process that goes into all our full education. So let's go on to that final question, and then we'll open up the floor to a forum. How do we integrate the arts into core disciplines? Um, so at our school, in the middle school, we have teams. Um, there are grade level teams, and um, our principal has created um, the arts, the phys ed, and the language team. So each team has a leader, and I'm the representative for the performing and visual arts as their team leader. Um, so we sit at a table, literally a round table, and everybody just talks about what is going on in their grade and their classes. Um, we look for opportunities where we can kind of say like, oh, you're doing that, why don't you talk to me about it? I'll get back to you and I'll show you some stuff that I have related to that. Um, I can help you and guide you if you need me to come in and talk to your class about how to start a project, that's great. So we constantly talk to each other. Um, I think you need to have that table though. You need to have that setting where you can have somebody speaking on behalf of or for your arts courses, um, and I think that's something that's been a tremendous help, and it's and we're not perfect, we're not doing everything that I think that we could do, but we started to, and I think that's very important, and I, I think it's helped to um, my, our, our colleagues, and Rachel's one of my colleagues, and our other colleagues presented a workshop to all the uh, middle school art teachers about the elements and principles of design, how to start an art piece, um, things to look for that will help you, references. Um, we actually made art with them, so we walked them through the process of it and how we would start a project. So all of those things should help an academic teacher who may not feel so readily inclined to look at you know, a project as a real art project and say, maybe I have some questions for Lydia or Rachel or one of the art teachers. Maybe I can invite someone to come speak to my class. So those conversations help to start integrating art into the core disciplines. And it's not always easy, but you know we're at the beginning stages and we're getting better at it and we keep working forward from there. Some of my most successful projects <coughs> have been done with, pardon me, where the, where the project is actually designed with a number of people. So, uh, including right now I'm building a greenhouse at a high school in Kenilworth and we're mosaicing the, it's a very complicated uh, project, but 
The science teacher, whose hobby is hybridizing day lilies, has worked with us like, oh, and then we can put in a butterfly garden, and I can help the kids, and we're gonna hybridize the plant the things that will bring the butterflies in, in the greenhouse. So if, if somebody just asked me to come into the school and say, what would you like to do with the students? I would not have probably said, oh, let's do, let's hybridize day lilies, and do a butterfly garden, not for the plant one. That wouldn't have occurred to me, but because that person is in at the very beginning mm -hmm. and the project evolves with other disciplines uh, right at, you know, right from the start, I, it, it, it just becomes a, a natural combination of disciplines. Uh, well, <clears throat> again, uh, integrating the arts into the core curriculum, I think uh, back maybe 400,000 years ago when there weren't any schools and the idea of integrating the arts into the core curriculum which just meant learning how to stay alive. Um, the arts, as, as music and dance and, and religion and worship and decorating, all of these things were, were part of life. Again, the, the, the implication is that there's something separate about the arts. So, Again, in my ideal school, I would begin early uh, as possible to begin to get the kids to understand what the word aesthetic means. And then, as far as infusing the arts, I would ask the kids to identify in a history class or in a mathematics class something that they thought, for some reason, had aesthetic value. It's beautiful, it's elegant, it's graceful. It's, it has equilibrium, it, it, it moves, it's dynamic. Uh, and then say, oh, uh, and then, you know, go on with that. How, how would you enlarge upon that idea? And, and then it becomes what people conventionally call art. But I, I would say it's an aspect of that subject so that people uh, constantly are trying not to disassociate art as though there were a problem putting this funny business into this business that we all respect and know we have to do. But that it was already in there. It's just a question of seeing it and then celebrating it and becoming part of it. And that's, that's, I guess that's what Great, okay. We've gotten through the six questions. So now I think you're, you had a question initially about the rating and where does that fit? Well, that was what you're talking about when you envisioned the idea of art program. None of you mentioned evaluation. And unfortunately, that's a big factor in teaching. You know, you have to deal with evaluation and set objectives. Do they meet the objective? Yeah. And the question is such a large question because who are we evaluating for what? For who? Is it for the student? Is it for the college? Is it for the parent? Is it to sort? That would be the college. So for the student, it is to learn. So where do our institutions allow us to be able to make this a meaningful experience to anybody? And I think, as a general rule, I have heard that it is that there is a fairly accepted uh, belief that grading creativity destroys creativity. So there lies our challenge. We're required to degrade it, and what do we do? I don't, I don't have to do any of that. Yeah. But, and also, you know, sometimes I come into a school and I'm there for such a short period of time that I just, you know, here are 30 kids, they're the five problems and they're the five stars. And that's, and that's sort of where, you know, that, that becomes my immediate awareness. Wait, well, that's your awareness of you can afford? No, that's my awareness. Oh. Um, you know, after I've had four days with some, you know, with a right. class. You know, I don't get to, I, you know, I only know the bad kids' names to stop them. <laughs> right? It, right, I mean, it's, it's just, it's the reality. Um, I think that a lot of the arts are sort of graded pass-fail on a, on, a, on a young, you know, they did the assignment, they didn't do the assignment. You know, they followed the directions, they didn't follow. Uh, yes. Right, you know, it's sort of a, you know, because you can't necessarily grade. And the, the older you get, I think, it, you know, you have to assign A, B, C, D, 
you know, I remember when I was in college, it was laid out. It's like, you've got to come to class every single time. Your grade's going to go down if you're not here. If you don't complete the amount of work, your grade goes down. Mm -hmm. It was very, very um, uh, structured. And you, but you can only get an A if you did a really good job. But you get a B, you know, if you, if you did the work and you came. And I thought that that was, well, if you had to devise a system, but what exactly is a really good job? I mean, who's determining what a really good job? Are they looking at the piece that you created and that's the determining factor? Or, I think mean, that's, you know, that, that's part of my problem too because I can have a student who can talk through that line, do it through the lines, a student just go off on a tangent. It's wonderful. But realistically, they can meet my the objectives of the lesson. It is. It's it's Tumble, difficult, you know? and you know, and I think it's just one of those things. Like, you know, you could be the same worker and have a boss that you connect with, or a boss that you don't connect with, and you'd be doing the exact same. I, yeah. I, you know, I think it's a tough reality. I don't know if there's any way around it. You know? Jennifer, what were you going to say? Well, art always fights the battle in terms of evaluation of. It's totally subjective. Who am I to say if it's good or bad? You tried, you did it, yay, and we clap. But then there's the other side of it, which is, and I don't know much about music, but you know, if you see the movie Whiplash, mm. no, no? Yes. you should see it. It's about a um, a music student in a music school, and it's like no matter how much effort he puts forth, he's like, I don't care about your confidence in yourself. I care about you playing this piece correctly. And there is an aspect of the high fine arts and aesthetics that is about that. You know, it's not about whether or not you felt you did a good job. You didn't do the choreography that I taught you. So in a school context, it's, it's like how do you always balance those things between like you want to encourage them and they did effort and they tried, but then art is all about freedom within constraints. Yeah. And, and how you use that, your kid sets that up all the time. Yeah, right? so, so, you know, there was of course, the, did they improve over the period of time? Did they were they there? Did they do the work? Did they improve? Did they try hard? I mean, those things you you see that you know when somebody tries hard. You know, you know right. when there's a breakthrough. When some kid doesn't do the homework, doesn't do the homework, finally does the homework, and I was like, oh my gosh, the world has opened up, and they yes, got so yes. many ideas. You know, so in some ways, you know, why not the why not the concrete? Benchmark as a way of evaluating because I'm not, I'm not sure that you can. I mean, really, you go to you know you go to galleries, and it's like I love it, I hate it, I love it, I hate it. Forty thousand dollars, forty thousand dollars, forty thousand dollars, forty thousand dollars. Go figure. Well, that's the, I don't just jump in. I mean, that's the total artificiality of the whole thing. The arts bring out the very worst uh, uh, for this kind of misconstruing the purpose of teaching. Uh, it, it's uh, this idea of discipline, this idea of following directions, I, all that's very important. I, I guess I would I would start out early in school and say, okay kids, we're in school. Uh, there are rules. And and we're gonna we're gonna have some grades at the end of this thing. But I want you to know what we're gonna grade on. And then lay out it's, it's showing up for class. It's listening to me very carefully, maybe even saying back to me what I want you to do. And if you don't want to do it, you can explain what you're about to do and we'll talk about it. But set up some, some things that have to do with kind of administrative criteria. But when you get to the point of saying, uh, is it beautiful or not? Does it, well, does it look like a horse? Uh, you know, some of does this fabulous uh, Arabian thing, and some of them does this. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they get an A, and they get you no. Know, that that's where you just I think have, uh, that sort of evaluation doesn't belong. In, in yeah, art. I'll, I'll just say parenthetically one thing I love about design uh, as a uh, project-based education is that the, the teacher. If you're teaching, if you've got kids and the assignment is to make a, a little car, a rubber band powered car that will go from here to there uh, in a certain amount of time, it either does or it doesn't. I mean, it's <laughs> pragmatic, it works or it doesn't. And it's, it's so beautiful because the kid, 
that, you know, it's not mommy or daddy or the teacher or something. It's Mother Nature, and it's a wonderful thing for them to put themselves in the position where their their teacher, in effect, is Mother Nature, and it, it worked. Um, hey, you know, that's fabulous, or it didn't, and, well, what do you do then? You go back and you make it work, that sort of thing. So design has that wonderful, um, engaging quality that just brings out the best but, but aesthetics, in far as judging art, I just art competitions for three third graders and stuff. I just say, <laughs> save the children. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for probably two years in a row, and hopefully they won't do it again. Uh, the Bird Community College has run a same sustainability contest, so to speak, of uh, kids coming in and how best can you use. Uh, your plastic bottles to make something. All right, it's a nice concept, all right? It helps the environment. I was judging this, but then I saw people set it up. And invariably, I mean, you're, you're talking about uh, kids want to know whether they're first or second in this, or whether they're third or fourth, or it goes back. But then you get the parents involved. And, 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 and it's, <laughs> and, and, right? And I mean, and, and, remember, and I taught uh, years ago, you know, I, I was an English teacher, so it's the poetry, everything else. But, um, you know, it was quite obvious that this third grader never built this little ship out of plastic bottles that you can make go over the water because you put some plastic, uh, you put some uh, bands on it, etc. But oh my God, you know, if the kid didn't get the first first place in this this contest, you know, all hell breaks loose, right? So if you if you say, well, it's really clever how this guy made this thing that propels through the water, but I think his parents. Did, you can be backed up by the other people, mm -hmm. and you and they might and the, so it becomes a discussion when you have to when you have to rank it. Maybe you feel that way, or the other two people say, you know, no, 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 it's just too clever. We have to give it first, and then you bow to them, mm -hmm. and it, you know you don't have to take the pressure on yourself. Mm -hmm. Carol, something we do in our classes that we really. Uh, try and do this and cater it to each student is write comments about their work. Um, so they have a sketchbook and we comment on their work. It's not a letter grade, but it's a summary of what you did well, um, something you could have improved on, um, and something maybe to do next time. And so they understand that it's not, here's a letter and there you go, you did all these right. things in your sketchbook and it just means a letter. So it has meaning attached to it for them. Um, we actually do grade, but we also write comments to each student with their report cards, and they've been separated recently. The grade is not attached to the comment that we write. The comment is tailored to each student's performance and what they did well, something to do next time, maybe improve on. So again, I'm very fortunate in being able to do that and, and having kids sure. feel like what they do matters mm -hmm. and what they say in class and how they interact mm -hmm. with each other matters. So it's not always easy to do with a large number of kids, but if there's opportunities where you could do something to that effect, I think that would help and it just make the student feel a little bit better, not, oh, she, she gave me a C and I worked so hard on that, you know? So. Right, I have tried to yeah. say that, it's yeah. wonderful. So we actually hand write <laughs> or type. There's a little yeah. butt there. Yeah. 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 We're doing lines today. <laughs> yeah. 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 Communication. Yeah. Okay, well, I, my one question would be, coming from the outside now and looking at this and no longer being in a, a classroom or anything, how do you make change? All right, this is, we've looked at the way it is, we've looked at the, the best things. Uh, what do you do to change the way it's currently? We know that arts are, are second best to STEM, et cetera. I mean, that's, I think that's a given. I, I don't think I'm saying anything out of school there by saying this. So how do you institute those collaborations with those STEM people to say, this is important what you're doing? But how do you get, do you go to school boards? Do you have the help of teachers unions? You know, where does that start for all of you? I think it starts with the individual, with yourself. Uh, as I see, you know, year to year, the projects I did. There were the children, I think it starts with me. What can I bring you to my classroom? That's number one. But we make it a point to talk to people at the lunch table and visit classrooms and just say, at the different meetings that we've had to negotiate to make ourselves present at. It wasn't always the case, 
we had to keep asking for our presence to be heard and eventually I don't think you can be ignored when there's so many of you asking for something. I don't think it's possible to ignore a group of people who really wants change or wants to affect change. So just getting out there, talking to people seriously about things that you could do to help them. I mean, I, who doesn't want help? <laughs> I want help and I wouldn't turn it down if somebody was really saying, I can help you to enhance what you already do um, and maybe take it to another level in a way that maybe you didn't know you could do. And um, at Arts Horizons, um, I work with schools to create um, arts education plans, strategic plans over five years, and sort of the first step is creating an arts leadership team. So hopefully yeah, the administration yeah. is on it, but if they're not, kind of like what Michael's doing, you know, getting a bunch of people who care about the same thing together um, with, you know, a, an agenda or a mission or, you know, here's a budget that we want, it starts to um, put what you need in their language and hopefully it's an interdisciplinary arts leadership team, but you know that's something anybody can do um, to start this dialogue that you know takes a while to to get going. I think one other thing is you can never say no. You know, yeah. um, uh, two years ago, my principal just came into the room after school and said, you know, we have, you know, I came in, I said, like, what's up? He said, uh, you know, <laughs> we have this, um, uh, you know, school culture. Uh, thing going on here is called Power of Peace, and I always thought that if we got arts involved, it would have more impact. What do you think? And I just got this vision of um, all these peace signs, really big peace signs, you know, big, small. And uh, I said, why don't we make a mural of these peace signs? Well, they'll be so big, they'll go beyond the edge of it. And uh, he got really excited about it. And then what happened, it came a school school project where each homeroom came up with a quote. Either they made their own quote or a quote that they found that talked about the power of peace. They quoted John Lennon. They quoted all these different pieces. And then I said, you know, it kind of reminds me of that Vietnam Memorial where mm -hmm. you, know, you walk and you look at the Vietnam Memorial and there's all these names. But when you come up close, then you see yourself and there's kind of a change in the dynamic. And that's how this mural was. You would see this big piece, these big peace signs. But when you came up, you read the, the quotes and you had this periphery of all the... And uh, that was a, uh, I mean, that was a huge project. I, at the end, I said, you know, maybe we're going to finish it next year. And the principal said, no, maybe we'll finish it this year. <laughs> so I said, okay, you know. But I mean, that's where all of a sudden everybody, I was only in the school two years, all of a sudden everybody knew who I was. And so I think, you know, you have to, you can't say no. You got to, you know, say yes. Um, I wanted to respond to what you said about the, the lack of time, because a lot of, academic teachers already feel really pressured to fit so much into their curriculum and they can they never have enough time to get you know the work done in order for the, the kids to take tests it's just it's a lot of pressure for them but I think with a little bit of creativity and working together you can find ways to modify projects um, for instance Lydia and I we um, we always have projects for when kids go on trips so if they go to the Museum of Natural History they have a drawing assignment that they do in front of the dioramas they're going to be going to the Met soon looking at Greek art. So we have an assignment that ties together what we're teaching them in class with the curriculum. Uh, something that I started doing last year with a teacher, which really ended up taking just two class periods, was um, to go along with the Greek, um, the ancient Greek pottery um, part of his unit. I actually had them making red clay pottery pieces in class and designing their own images using um, different Greek keys, figures from Greek history, and painting it on the pottery. And in order to help the teacher get the project done in just a couple periods, I made an instructional video. And now here, you know, we're fortunate because we have iPads in the middle school, but um, you know, within a few hours, I figured out like how to write a script and kind of go through the whole process so that the kids could watch the video the night before, sort of a flipped classroom model, and then come in and kind of be ready. And the teacher and I, we met after school, we made the clay balls, we kind of prepped everything but um, within two 45-minute periods, they were able to make a whole Greek pot, paint it, and then they presented it later at something we have here called Greek Day, where all different teachers from different disciplines get together and they have the kids do all kinds of activities like um, construction challenges based on ancient Greek, Greek history and ancient games. So that's just one example, but I think with a little bit of work and maybe giving kids that they can do at home to prepare them, you can do some really fun and interesting projects. 
hate to, uh, to, to tie, tie up the formal part of this, but I, I think it's great that everybody can stay for a bit. There's no reason for anybody to, to move on and to continue your dialogue and your discussion. And unfortunately, I have to be at another location in, in the middle of Manhattan in oh. 35 Good minutes luck. at oh another God. meeting. <laughs> so Thank you very much.